gone is uh, March Madness started. Who here has filled up? Yeah, go Ducks. Who here has filled out a bracket? Let's try that again. Who here has filled out a bracket? Wow, okay. We've got some work to do here. Um, I, uh, I have an app. It's like the official NCAA March Madness app. And it keeps me up to date on the games. I can actually watch the games live and things like that. It's, it's kind of cool. But one of the things that you could do is you can go in there and fill out a bracket with your predictions for who's going to win March Madness, which, if you don't know, is the National College Basketball Championship. And it starts with technically 68 teams, and then it'll whittle its way down to uh, a national champion. And... Um, Thousands upon thousands of people from all over the world, except apparently in Longview, um, <laughs> get on this app and fill out their brackets, their predictions for who's going to win every game all the way up to the national championship. And I got a message this morning that said there are actually two people of all the thousands of people around the world who filled out brackets, there are two people who still have perfect brackets. They have accurately predicted every game so far. And I am thinking to myself, who are these people? I want to avoid them. (laughs) There is something wrong with them. Who in their right mind actually predicted Liberty University was going to win a basketball game? (laughs) It's worse is who in their, uh, other than Slade, Slade graduated from Liberty University, so um, he's kind of compelled to pick Liberty. But even worse than that, UC Irvine, the Anteaters, won a basketball game. The only team I'm going to predict the Anteaters are going to beat would be the Sloths. Um, (laughs) I love March Madness precisely because it is so unpredictable. It is unexpected, and it is filled with drama. Teams that are very, very good are expected to do well but yet they could lose to teams that no one knows anything about, like the UC Irvine Anteaters or Liberty University. Someone gets eliminated from the tournament every single game. It is high, high drama, and that means there are tears and disappointments, and a lot of times these players don't see it coming. They walk in sure that they're going to win. And they leave stunned that they've lost. It's exactly the kind of madness, the unpredictability, the unexpected that Jesus is preparing his disciples to face. In John 13 through 18, Jesus is leaving. This was unexpected. Jesus is leaving the disciples and he is leaving them behind in a broken world without his physical presence. And Jesus has the disciples gathered in an upper room. And this is his last opportunity to teach them, to be with them, to encourage them before he goes to the cross. This is his last opportunity to tell them where they can find courage to face an unpredictable world. We're in our 10th week in this series, and it's called the Upper Room Series because that's where it takes place. This is, as I've said, the last teaching time that Jesus has with his disciples before he goes to the cross. And I thought it would be helpful this morning to take a few seconds and review where we have been. Let's look at the the overall picture of what Jesus has been saying to the disciples and remember the main thing that he is doing is he is preparing them for his departure. 
And I think you can take what he has said to the disciples and break it into three broad topics. And the first one is he is preparing the disciples for his departure by telling them how they need to relate to one another. The teaching time starts in John 13 with an object lesson. Remember, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and this was a model that they were to follow of how they were to treat one another, sacrificial servanthood. Then we saw that Jesus predicts that one of them, Judas, is going to betray them. But even within that prediction, we saw Jesus' love for Judas. And we also saw that Jesus makes it clear that he is in control, even as he is going to be betrayed. And then chapter 13 ends with Jesus commanding the disciples that they are to love one another. And it is by this, how they treat one another and love one another, that the world will know that they are Jesus' disciples. Starting in chapter 14, Jesus changes the focus a little bit to the ongoing relationship the disciples are going to have with him and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus begins by promising that he will continue to work in them and through them, even after he has ascended to the Father. He then promises that it's not just he that's working in them and through them, but the Holy Spirit will be at work in them and through them. And then as a result, the disciples are to continue to follow Jesus. Even though he's physically not there, they are still to follow him. And then finally, Jesus prepared the disciples for opposition. The world rejected Jesus, and guess what? The disciples' assignment is to be like Jesus, and so the world is going to reject them. But the disciples are not going to face this rejection alone. The Holy Spirit will enable them to endure the world's opposition. And in the end, and we saw this last week when Slade brought the message, and he showed us that Jesus promises the disciples that grief is going to turn to joy. Sorrow will be replaced with joy. Today's passage actually ends Jesus' teaching time. It doesn't end the series, but it ends his time of teaching the disciples because when he starts in chapter 17, Jesus transitions into prayer. So as we look at these verses today, we are looking at the last part of his teaching time. And in this last part of his teaching time, we see that Jesus shows them where they can find the courage to face what is ahead. They will find that courage in the Father's love for them and Jesus' victory. But right in the middle of Jesus explaining this, we see the disciples make a very profound point. The profound point is they still don't get it. But Jesus starts by reassuring them that they have a heavenly Father who cares for them. Now, up to this point, Jesus has been intentionally confusing about the Father. That's actually what the Greek word means when it says he has been talking in figures of speech in verse 25. It's not just saying that he used illustrations. It's not just talking about parables. It's just actually saying that he was intentionally puzzling. But that's about to change. A whole new way of relating to the Father is about to kick off because of Jesus' death burial, resurrection, and ascension back to the Father, everything is going to change about how the disciples will know God and know about God. We've seen in other passages that it's going to be through the Holy Spirit that Jesus will teach the disciples, and they will learn clearly what the Father is like. Verses 26 and 27 also show that the communication goes both ways. It's not just that the disciples will hear from Jesus about the Father, the Father is going to hear directly from the disciples. Jesus is saying that when the disciples come to the Father with their request, the Father hears them directly. And remember what it means in the Bible when it says that, that someone hears or listens. It's not just that they get the sound waves. It's that they get the sound waves. They hear, they listen, and they respond. We saw that to pray in Jesus' name means not just to slap some formula at the end of a prayer so you can get what you want. It means to align with what Jesus wants. You are asking 
that your request would advance Jesus' reputation, that it would advance Jesus' purposes. And Jesus, Jesus reassures that the Father loves you, that the Father personally is attentive to you. And that is all the reason that he needs his love, his care for you, to listen carefully to what you ask for and respond with what is best. Verse 28 is an interesting verse. It's basically a one-verse summary of the entire gospel of John. In verse 28, what it's basically saying is that Jesus is the Son of God who came from the Father on a mission, and he is going to return to the Father when the mission is complete. And when I read this verse, here's what confused me. Why would Jesus say this now? How in the world does this connect with what he just said in the previous verses? And then it dawned on me. What Jesus is doing is he is ask, answering an unasked question. He is answering the question, why should we believe that the Father loves us? What can you point at that demonstrates that the Father loves us in the midst of living in a broken and distressing world? How can the disciples know that the Father loves them and the answer is Jesus? How can they know that the Father loves them and will listen to them? He has proven it and he proved it by sending Jesus. How do you know that the Father loves you? How do you know that in the midst of distress, confusion, struggle, that the Father listens to you and cares? You know that because of Jesus. You know that because he sent his son for you. And this gives us courage when we are facing a troubled world. And it gives us courage because we know for certain that the person who has our future in his hands has clearly proved his love for us. See, when you understand how much the Father cares, it begins to release us, begins to release you from, de from your dependence on those things that are around you. One of my favorite Christian writers is a guy by the name of G.K. Chesterton. He was a British guy who lived beginning of the 1900s. And one of the things that he wrote is this fantastic book. It's a biography on St. Francis of Assisi. You never know if it's Assisi or Assisi. Assisi sounds Assisi. Um, <laughs> Chesterton said this about St. Francis. He says, St. Francis turned martyrdom into a way of life. For the sake of Christ, St. Francis learned to die daily to the idols that threatened to dominate his life. Ego, pleasure, power, success. And that is why he lived such a vital and passionate life. You see, St. Francis was born into a wealthy family. He had everything he could ever want. He had power and influence and wealth. And he walked away from all of it to live as a beggar. Why did he do that? Because he was convinced of two things. He was convinced that this is what God was calling him to do personally. And he was convinced that God loved him and had his well-being in his hands. He knew that he did not depend on circumstances for his well-being. He knew that he did not depend on wealth and power and influence for his well-being. He knew his heavenly father would care for him, whether he had little or would he had much. And that allowed him to face rejection, poverty, homelessness, and profound misunderstanding. The point's not that we should live as beggars. The point is that when we really grasp 
God's love for us, like St. Francis did, we trust that no matter what our circumstances are, we are under the Father's care. Even if the circumstances are painful, we know that we are cared by the Father. I was challenged to ask myself the question, what do I think I need to feel cared for in this world? See, in a broken world, I'm going to be let down. And if my hopes, my purpose, my sense of value are all dependent on something in this world, on relationships or position or influence or financial status, I am going to feel uncared for a whole lot. If I trust that the Father loves me and hears me, then I can suffer the losses inflicted by a fallen, broken world and still know that I will be okay. Jesus reassures the, the disciples that the Father loves them and he hears them. And the Father has proved it in a way that they could point to and know, and so can we. He sent his Son. And the disciples' response to that reassurance is to completely miss the point. And we see this in their misplaced confidence. You ever had a conversation with someone and what's going on in your head is, um, did you hear what I just said? You have no idea how many times that happens to me around the subject of, I'm allergic to cheese. <laughs> I go out to eat and someone says, well, I just sprinkled the cheese on top. Did you hear what I just said? I'm allergic to cheese. Fortunately, I'm not deathly allergic to cheese. I'm violently sick allergic to cheese. I say fortunately because the worst situation I ever faced was when I was in college. A guy that I worked with at the college library invited me over to his house to have dinner. And yes, I told him I'm allergic to cheese. Now, this guy also happened to be Phil Kagey's drummer, former drummer. So um, I was highly motivated to go. And I was highly motivated to stay when his wife announced, I made seven cheese lasagna tonight. <laughs> and she rationalized, it doesn't taste the same without the cheese. No, seven cheese lasagna is not going to taste the same without the cheese. And then she said, further, it's cooked in, so that's okay, right? <laughs> what part of I'm allergic to cheese did she miss? That was my first thought. My second thought was a drummer for a famous Christian musician is trying to kill me, and that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> So I ate the lasagna and excused myself to the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, I don't know that they knew that I got very, very sick. Um, and so I'm sure to this day, she continues to serve seven cheese lasagna to people with cheese allergies. <laughs> Jesus is having a did you hear what I just said moment with the disciples. He just said to them, that the hour is coming when he will speak plainly. That's future tense. The time has not yet come. But the disciples think, okay, now they've got Jesus figured out. And what they say about Jesus in verse 30 is actually, interestingly, pretty good when you know the context behind it. You see, it was a common belief in that time that you could tell if someone had a special connection from God or assignment from God, if this person knew things they wouldn't otherwise know. Now, I'm not sure how mothers fit into that, because they always seem to know things that they shouldn't know. But apparently they also have a special connection with God. And this was especially true if someone could answer your question without you asking the question. 
that was considered a sign that you had a unique, special connection with God. And so what they're affirming is that Jesus has this unique, special relationship, mission from, assignment from God. Here's what's interesting. Our culture is filled with people who would say that Jesus has a unique connection with God. Our churches are filled with people who would say that Jesus has a unique connection with God. And just like with the disciples, that is a true statement insofar as it goes. But it doesn't go far enough. It's not enough to say that Jesus has great insights about God. It's not enough to say that Jesus was a great example and then stop there. The problem is that that is too shallow of an understanding of who Jesus is. And in verses 31 and 32, Jesus reveals that this was exactly the disciples' problem. Their understanding was too shallow. Right, you can almost hear the exasperation in Jesus' voice. Do you honestly think you believe at this point? And in verse 32, what he's saying is, here, let me show you what you believe. Every one of you who just said that I have this unique connection with God is about to abandon me. And we know that in a few hours when Jesus is arrested, that's exactly what's going to happen. The disciples are going to feel threatened. They're going to feel unsafe and they will scatter. They will run. Jesus told the disciples that the Father loves them and listens to them. Jesus was sent by God on a mission and is going to return when that mission is finished. And the disciples' response to Jesus is essentially to say, we have got you figured out now. We know what box to put you in. And Jesus' response back is, no, you don't. And the proof is in how you're about to respond when you are tested. You will abandon me. And don't you and I do the same thing? We'll come together. We'll affirm that God loves us. We'll agree that we are in his care. And when we feel threatened, we will scatter. Looks different, right? We're not being threatened by soldiers. We don't run away physically. But our threats are to things like our sense of value, our sense of purpose, when those things are threatened, we do whatever we can to protect them. So we know that being near Jesus means telling the truth on a timesheet, but our finances feel threatened, and so we scatter by misrepresenting the number of hours that we work. We know that being near Jesus means standing up for the person that is being talked about, but our acceptance feels threatened, and we scatter by staying silent. We believe so many right things about Jesus, but we fail to believe at a deep level that he really is capable of protecting us and caring for our well-being. And that's where the disciples were at when Jesus says this to them. They believed a lot of right things, but they didn't really trust that he would be capable of protecting their well-being. The world is broken. It's a source of great pain and opposition. But the disciples can take courage because their father loves them. The disciples don't fully understand the significance of that yet. They don't fully understand Jesus' role in caring for them yet. But Jesus is about to clarify that as he closes in the last verse by saying that he is a savior who conquers. This is the verse, this is the last sentence of Jesus' teaching time with his disciples. And I want to pick it apart carefully so we really see what's going on here. Because this is an amazing summary of everything Jesus has said, starting back at the beginning of chapter 13. But these things that Jesus refers to covers everything that he has said that night in the upper room. He's going all the way back to verse 1 of chapter 13. Then Jesus explains his purpose behind everything that he has said. 
that by being connected to him, the disciples would have peace. Remember what peace is in the Bible. It's not just the absence of conflict. It's well-being. It's even flourishing. They will have this peace in the world. And remember, as we've gone through this series, what we've said that the world means in John's gospel. It's not just the place we live. It's not just the planet. It refers to anything and everything that opposes God. Because they live in a place that opposes God, the disciples are going to face tribulation. We've already seen that Jesus has told them that they're going to face opposition and persecution. But this word that's translated tribulation not only refers to that, but it refers to any kind of affliction, any kind of distress that comes from living in a fallen and broken world. And then Jesus gives the first command that he has given in a long time. He tells them to take heart. This is actually one word in Greek, and it means to be courageous in the face of danger. Then Jesus ends by explaining why it is that they can take heart. It's because he has overcome the world. And this word translated overcome has the idea of conquering, of achieving victory over something. So nothing in all of creation, nothing that stands to oppose God or stands to oppose Jesus can stop Jesus from accomplishing his plans in and through the disciples. So let me retranslate the verse this way. Jesus tells the disciples, everything that I have taught you in this upper room tonight, I told you for the purpose that you would experience well-being as you stay connected to me. You live in a fallen world that opposes me. And because of that, you are going to face all kinds of distress. But be courageous. Because nothing that opposes me, nothing that distresses you, will keep me from accomplishing my mission for you and in you and through you. Jesus knew as he said these words to, to the disciples what was in their future. He knew that their future would include things like sickness and imprisonment. He knew that their future would include things like being forced to leave their homes. He knew that their future would include things like being abandoned by family. He knew that for some of these disciples, it would include being put to death. But nothing, nothing would stop Jesus from accomplishing his purposes. Nothing. That relieves a lot of pressure. Just thinking about someone this week who received some very hurtful communication from her adult son. She's trying to figure out how to respond. She's trying to figure out how to respond in a way that acknowledges her pain, that deals with, deals with her pain, and yet loves her son well. This is a bad situation that she has found herself in as a mom. And yet, Jesus promises that he will accomplish his purposes even in this situation. I was thinking about a friend of mine who I've known for years and years back in Oregon. He struggles with mental illness, addiction. He's been in and out of prison. But he has come to know the Lord. And he wants to follow the Lord. And he is growing in Christ. But guess what? He still struggles with mental illness, addiction, and some problematic behaviors that get him in trouble. you know what? Jesus has a message for him. Nothing in this broken world, including his own brokenness, is going to prevent Jesus from accomplishing his purposes in my friend's life. Every person in this room faces tribulation. You face something that is distressing you, and if you're not facing it now, you are going to face it. 
whether it's illness, broken relationship, financial stress, whatever it might be. There are so many things that can distress us in a broken world. We can be overwhelmed by it. And this verse has a message for you. Take heart. Be courageous. Your pain is legitimate, but nothing that you face will keep God from working in you and through you. He is going to accomplish his purposes in this world, and he is going to accomplish his purposes in you and for you. Where do we find courage to face a broken, troubled world filled with pain and disappointment? We find it in the Father's love, his love for us, his care for us. We find it in Jesus' victory over that broken world. I think that's the point that Jesus is making to the disciples. And it's the point of the message. Find your courage in the Father's love and Jesus' victory. I have a confession to make. It's a hard confession to make in front of this group. I really like Gonzaga. They're a small school from the Pacific Northwest. Their coach is the son of a pastor, and he seems like just a terrific person. And they beat Baylor last night. And I actually have a soft spot for Baylor because I live here. So at the end of the game, I'm watching these Baylor players as they're walking off the court. Watching them knowing it was the last time for many of them that they would ever play. This was the end of their basketball career. And I felt for them. They had just lost something that they loved and had been such an important part of their lives for their entire lives. And in a moment, it was gone. That loss that they felt is just a small picture of the loss that was ahead of the disciples. And it's a small picture of the losses that many of us are going to face in the year ahead. But Jesus tells us, take courage. The Father loves you. Nothing will keep Jesus from fulfilling his promise in your life. And his promises and his purposes are better than your greatest dream. So how do we respond to something like this? Well, again, there are four ways. And just as a reminder, on this bulletin, there is a place that you can indicate to us how you would like to respond, whether it's one of those four or something else, or it's a way you can also indicate prayer requests to us. And if you slip it in one of the boxes in the foyer, it's either to my right or left as you go out. The staff will get those, and we will pray for you as you, uh, as you seek to apply God's word. Four suggestions. Again, as always, the Christian life is not meant to be lived alone, so I would encourage you to discuss these questions with someone, the discussion questions that are on your handout. It's just a few verses, but these, these few verses have a lot to say about our Heavenly Father. And I would encourage you to go back and review this passage and see what it has to say about Him. Spend some daily time in prayer. Tell the Father how you feel troubled and tell him with the confidence that he hears you and that he cares. And then last, if there's an area of your life where you're facing trouble, there is almost certainly a courageous next step that you need to take. For one mother this week, it was picking up the phone and calling me and saying, I'm really struggling with what I just heard from my son. Would you pray for me? For you, it might be, I am carrying this burden and I feel all alone. I need someone to pray with me and for me. We've got a whole bunch of people at the end of the service who are going to be standing down here to do just that. Whatever it is, courageously take the next step in whatever trouble you face. So I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And as I just said, these folks are going to be here to stand with you and pray with you no matter what trouble you're facing. But we certainly want to introduce you to the Jesus who has conquered the world if you do not yet know him. And as that prayer team comes forward, I want to invite all of us to stand and let's go courageously before the Father who hears us and loves us. 
Heavenly Father, we do come before you, and we come before you confidently. We come before you knowing that you love us and you hear us, and we know it because we can point to tangible proof. You have sent your son. Even when we were your enemies, even when there was nothing lovable about us, you sent your son to die for us that our sins would be forgiven, to be raised again that we would have new life and be made new creatures, and that we would have relationship with you now and for all eternity. Lord, we can't even really fathom that love, but we thank you that you give it. Father, we have people here that are facing so many significant trials and tribulations. And I ask, Lord, that you would sink a little deeper into their hearts today the truth that you love them and you hear them and that your son has conquered everything that opposes them and everything that opposes this world and his purposes will be fulfilled in their lives. Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.